A million reasons to walk away from Jesus. What a positive, uplifting chapter number 9 has been. Turn in your copy of the Word of God to Luke chapter 9. We've seen in here, verse 22, Jesus gave His disciples news they didn't want to hear. I'm going to be rejected, suffer, and die. He then told them, you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross and deny yourself. Verse 41, He called His disciples unbelieving and perverse. In verse 48, he tells them, the servant is the greatest. Stop wanting your own way. In verse 49, make room for others and their preferences. Verse 55, when you're hurt and offended, you don't get to fight back. We're here to save, not condemn. So time and time again, it seems like Jesus is giving his disciples reasons to walk away, reasons to quit being disciples, and he's not done. I'm going to give you three more reasons, on top of a million reasons, to walk away from Jesus. Chapter 9, verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, Permit me first to go and bury my father. And he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another said to him, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to go say goodbye to those at home. And Jesus said unto him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Ever notice when you don't feel like doing something, it's easy to come up with all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't do it. One afternoon, Ileana says to me, hey, let's paint the hall. And I say, oh, okay, let's, let's do it. Uh, how about Saturday? And she says, how about now? It'll only take two hours. By the way, how, who has wives that thinks a, a project only will ever take two hours? So, so, some of you know where I'm going with this one, don't you? And I'm like, two hours? No way! And I started listing all the obstacles, all the roadblocks why, w w that would need to be circumvented in order to do the job. Well, you know, it's 3 p.m., and it's going to take two hours just to go get the paint and the supplies. And by the time we, time we get back, it's going to be time for supper, and we'll have to get the kids ready for bed, and we won't get done until late. And she says, you just don't want to do it. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not that I don't want to. I'm just talking about all that will take place. Well, it sounds to me like you're focusing on the negative in order to convince me to not want to do it. No, 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 no. I'm happy to do it. I, it just saying maybe not now. How about Saturday? Well, never mind. If you don't want to do it, then we just won't do it. Fine! We'll do it now! And at 11.30 at night, I'm painting that hall going, I knew it was going to take this long. But she does have a point. Because I will admit, whenever I don't want to do something, I don't always say, no, I don't want to. I'll just start throwing excuses as to why we can't. And she's smarter than me, and she always wins these psychological battles. She outmaneuvers me. That's why I hired her to be a counselor. So here in Luke chapter 9, people are thinking, wow, Jesus, look at what he can do. Is he the Messiah? It sure looks that way. We ought to get behind him. We ought to follow him. But everyone that Jesus comes in contact with, everyone he speaks to, he knows their minds and he knows their hearts. So regardless of their words or their reasons, he knows what their true intentions are. Back when I used to get haircuts, I always ended up playing this polite little game. You go sit in the chair and this person you don't know is going to cut your hair and instead of just awkwardly doing that duty, they make Small talk. And one of the polite small talk topics, of course, is what do you do for a living? And as soon as I say pastor, well, what church? Oh, yes, I know where that is. And now we're going to go down this road. I'm going to ask them if they have a church, and they're going to say, well, kind of, sort of, used to, and admit they need to get back. And now I'm going to give them all the positive attributes about Faith Bible Church, and they're going to seem genuinely interested, and I'm going to tell them that they should come check us out. Oh, well, of course. 
they will agree because they would like a tip. So they're going to tell me whatever I want to hear, and I invite them, and I leave a business card, and I keep my eye open for them, and in 13 years, only one has ever showed up. And after two weeks, they stop coming because there are a million reasons not to come. And yes, I know a million is an exaggeration, but it sure feels like I've heard a million excuses. Jesus, likewise, who knows people's hearts and minds, definitely has heard what people have thought, and he's heard all kinds of reasons why they are not going to follow him. Like this one, for example, in verse 57, where the fellow says, I will follow you wherever, and Jesus replies to him, foxes have holes, the birds have, the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere's to lay his bed, lay his head. I'll follow you wherever, he says. Sounds like the right thing to say. Seems like this man has the commitment. But what is his motivation? Does he assume the Messiah is leading to a throne, to a prestigious position? We saw last week his current disciples were enamored with having a position of greatness in the Messiah's administration. They were debating which one of them were going to be the greatest in the kingdom. You think you want to follow the, the Messiah? Why? Do you think that there's some money in it? Is there some profit? So Jesus says to this guy, and he says to every one of us, let's clear this up right from the outset. This is not going to be a lucrative endeavor. Jesus says, look at me. I have no palace. I have no throne. I don't have a room to call my own or a bed to lay my head. After growing up as a pastor's kid, I concluded in high school that I would not go into the ministry because I always remembered hearing this phrase, we can't afford this and we can't afford that. And I was well aware that we didn't have a lot of money. I learned early on that if I wanted uh, anything, I would need to get a job and I could earn the money, otherwise I would have to do without. That didn't really hurt me one bit because it groomed me to have a work ethic and to not waste time and it taught me how to be productive. Nevertheless, I knew my dad was not getting paid much at all. So I concluded in high school, being poor is no fun. I don't think I will be a pastor. I think I will go study business. And I applied, and I got accepted at the University of New Brunswick to study business. But when I went there for orientation, I could just feel in my soul that I was not supposed to be there. Uh, nothing about it felt right. I just had an intuition that I would mess up. I would be in big trouble if I stayed in that environment. So instead, Washington Bible College down here in Maryland, uh, the coach for the basketball team was a friend of the family, and he uh, said I could play ball if I came down and went to Bible school. And I just needed one good reason, and that was one good reason. Because when you're 18, you don't know what you do with your life. Playing basketball was a good enough reason to choose that school. So lo and behold, I ended up following my father's footsteps and doing full-time Christian ministry and just kind of had to decide that we won't worry too much about money. Somehow, that always seems to take care of itself. And uh, that's how Jesus has rolled for the last three years. He doesn't have a job. He didn't have an income. He doesn't have any property. He doesn't have a residence. He travels around ministering to people town to town and it seems like the food and the shelter always takes care of itself and finds him. And we too, the McNutts, have experienced that type of supernatural provision. There's been different times where Eliana would pray and ask God for a particular type of housing situation for us, and God would grant her her request. And he has always supplied all of our needs. I think I read that somewhere, that my God shall supply all of your needs. Just don't confuse needs with wants. People need Jesus. We all need what he has to offer. But many people don't particularly get what they want from Jesus. What is it that people want that perhaps Jesus doesn't give? Well, in this instance, he talks about creature comforts, security. I know there are examples of preachers and ministries that have been very lucrative. Those are the exceptions. Those are not the norm. A couple of examples from my life. My father was 20 years old. And he got a piece of land from my grandfather and built a house in 1973. It probably cost him like $15,000 to build that house. And uh, 
he had it till about 1975, and then he sold it and went off to follow the call of God, went to the ministry, went to Bible school. And since that time, he sold that house in 1975. For the next 15 years, he was never able to buy another house. Never owned a place until I graduated from high school, and he was able to get enough resources pulled together to buy a house. I think I was eating too much or something. The grocery bill was too high. Couldn't afford that. I, he finally finished paying a mortgage maybe three years before he retired, when he finally got out of paying for a mortgage. The uh, Baptist Convention churches in the Maritime Provinces of Canada, where we're from, they're, they're all looking for pastors who have master's degrees. Well, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with wanting a trained man. Yes, but the average salary they're offering is 30 to 35K. So you go and spend the money to get the master's, and then you come out and you spend the rest of your life trying to pay it off. So most people in ministry in Canada were not saving for retirement. We were trying to afford the five-gallon gas and the $3 a dozen eggs, and the $7 a gallon milk. And for all you people that voted for socialism, that's what you're coming your way. So just so you know, I'll make you aware if you have any questions about how that system works. Hard to save for retirement when you're trying to buy groceries for today. And by the way, our missionaries are all in the same boat. They don't have big savings when they're done their missionary assignments. I didn't know anyone in ministry who was rich. The understanding was always, if you go into full-time ministry, you're not going to have much by way of financial security. So needless to say, I'm very fortunate to be living in St. Mary's County, serving at Faith Bible Church. Of the 3,142 counties in the United States of America, St. Mary's is in the top 25 percentile of the wealthiest. They're up there in the top 25, not percentile, they're in the top 25 counties. And uh, the richest area in this nation is in the DMV, right? Of the top 20 wealthiest counties in the country, 10 of them are around the District of Columbia. And we have people here who give to this ministry far and beyond the national average. Faith Bible Church is exceptional at giving. People here are extraordinarily committed to the vision and the support of the ministries of this church. And we thank God and we praise Him for all of the abundance He has poured out. In 2020, Bobby has been an abundant year, hasn't it? And I already told the folks you're going to give a report here in a couple of weeks. So you're on the hook for that. Now, we thank God for that. However, we also pay attention to the culture. We feel the winds of change blowing across this land. Some of us who grew up in poorer parts of the world recognize the trajectory of where the new administration is planning to take this nation. I recognize the mindset of people who clamor for more government control of the economy. They think they're going to gain security by voting for more government handouts. But this kind of rationale, which in my experience is fueled by envy, only leads to dependency and less freedom. It leads to more regulations and less personal integrity and ingenuity. It leads to more apathy and less exceptionalism. And when this happens in the economy, the economic engine of this nation gets bogged down in the D.C. swamp, people are going to be suffering. And the false god of the almighty inflated dollar will evaporate, and people's visions of financial security will vanish. And then people's commitment to following Jesus and giving to the ministry will be tested like it hasn't been in decades. Now, I started with no security, and I learned how to live out of God's hand for my daily provisions. And I'm well aware that we could be right back in that same scenario really quick. And when that happens, you will need to count the cost of being a follower of Jesus. As it stands, I've already seen many people who have counted the cost of obeying Jesus and decide, I don't know if that's safe. Jesus requires a lot of sacrifice. I might have to give up my lifestyle. I might have to give up on these friendships. People who have this ungodly lifestyle won't accept me anymore if I tell them what Jesus' word says. It's not safe to go to church. We could get sick there. People are very demanding. They're always swarming around Jesus with their leprosy and their sickness and their demon possession. It's just not very sanitary. 
No place to lay down and rest. Need some downtime. My creature comforts, my memory foam, my Wi-Fi. Follow you, Jesus, but is there free Wi-Fi included in that? Paul and the disciples always called themselves bond slaves of Jesus. The thing about being a slave is commands are not optional. Commands are not optional. Obedience is required. Oh, unless it's unsafe, of course. I've always had an ear for commercials and marketing slogans that uh, disagree with the biblical worldview. And I remember, I don't know if you, you caught this, back in April and May, all of a sudden hearing all the commercials, everyone parroting this slogan, your safety's our number one priority. Your safety's our number one priority. As soon as I heard that, I thought, not here. Not for me. Not for Faith Bible Church. Safety, security, creature comforts have not been, nor will ever be, a priority of a disciple of Jesus. Matter of fact, these things are inconsequential to Jesus personally. I have no place to lay my head, he says. Meaning what? If you're going to follow me, creature comfort, security is not guaranteed. That's not new for me. I grew up my whole life in churches singing songs like, sometimes on the mountain where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along Sometimes in the valley, in the darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Though sorrows befall us and Satan oppose, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow. You know, some folks have given their prayer request today going through great sorrow. But God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. I had that drilled in my head early and often that following Jesus meant that safety would not be a number one priority. So there's one in a million reasons why not to follow Jesus. Want some more? Oh yeah, this is exciting. Verse 59, he said to another, follow me. And he said, Lord, permit me to first go bury my father. And he said, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere is the kingdom of God. Wow, that's very insensitive, Jesus. Dude's just, dad just died, Jesus. I mean, let him go do a funeral and buy some flowers, for goodness sakes. So a Jewish funeral was quite elaborate. Uh, first, the body was washed and wrapped, and then it would be paraded to the tomb, family tombs, catacombs. Uh, the immediate family would stay in the home for seven days of mourning. So they'd be there for seven whole days. People would be bringing them food and visiting them in the morning. After seven days, most aspects of ordinary life would return. However, the death of a parent was exceptional. Children mourned their parents' death for an entire year until the time of the second burial. The second burial, at that time, a private ceremony of the, of, the, of the children, family members would return to the tomb, take the bones of their deceased off of the resting place on the shelf, and then uh, bury them officially. So this is something that we have no knowledge of here in the West, but I suspect in this scenario, the man's father has died, and he's at some point in that year of mourning, which means it could potentially be another several months before he would be available to follow Jesus. So, yes, your family is important. God commands, honor your father and your mother. But honoring your father and your mother, does that mean reject Jesus and his call? In this scenario, we're talking about the traditions of men versus the commandments of God. The whole year-long burial ceremony is way too demanding. That's above and beyond what would be reasonable. That is a tradition of men. Jesus doesn't say that you have to wait a year before. The Bible doesn't talk about waiting a year before you bury your parents. That was just something the Jews came up with. And Jesus does not have a year to wait around for this fellow to get at serving God. Jesus calling on your life ought, to, ought not to take a back seat to your family. 
Jesus' calling on your life ought not to take a back seat to your family traditions. You know in certain parts of the world to profess to be a believer means that you could be thrown out of your family, ostracized from your community. Your life could be in danger. This past week in India, a pastor was shot in the street in front of his own wife for the crime of baptizing some people. Baptized three people in that town. Well, that's horrible. Totally not worth following Jesus in India. Why would anyone become a Christian if it meant your life would be in jeopardy and your community would alienate you and your family would disown you? Family is more important than Jesus, isn't it? Surely your father's death is more important than Jesus. That's a good reason not to be a disciple. Another one in a million. Uh, and the other question I have is, what does Jesus mean by the, let the dead bury the dead? That might have been a little come across a little rude. The word dead is used in this passage in two different senses. The Jews use the word dead often to express indifference towards things or to express that something has no influence over them anymore. Paul uses it this way. To be dead to the law, he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. To be dead to sin, he says in Romans chapter 6, means that the law and sin has no influence or control over us. We are free from them and we act as though they're non-existent. So people of the world are dead to Christ. They do not understand His plans, nor do they hear His voice and desire to follow Him. The people of the world are those whom the Savior describes here as spiritually dead. They should be the ones to bury the physically dead. Let people, He says, who aren't interested in my work and who are dead to sin, let them take care of that traditions of men, that duty. Your duty is to follow me. The point is, Jesus needs to come first. And this would have been especially in the instance here where this man is getting a personal invitation from Jesus. Right? Jesus is directly saying to this guy, come follow me. And you know you can rattle off the disciples' names. right? Peter, James, John, you know, you know these guys. And we know in the book of Revelations it talks about these 24 thrones that are around the throne of God. And we have a sneaking suspicion that those disciples are going to be sitting in 12 of those thrones for all of eternity. This guy, maybe he could have been one of them. We don't even know who this guy is. He's just some guy who chose a tradition of man over the calling of God. Jesus needs to come first. Nothing can be more important. And that is a reason for many not to follow him. They have this list of things they want to do. And Jesus is just down here. He's on the list, but he's not the highest priority. Verse 61. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me permit to say goodbye to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I think every parent has certain things that are kind of important in their, their home, kind of their standards they want the kids to follow. Some parents, it's good grades. That's, that's the highest priority. I've seen some parents, neat and tidy. That's kind of the number one thing they want the kids to be, neat and tidy. Good luck. Some parents, it, it's, it's quiet and orderly. You know, the, the yes sir, no ma'am type of things, those are important. Me, I, I personally can tolerate bad grade here and there. I'm more tolerant than Ileana on that, but, you know, I was not too worried about that. Uh, I don't mind noise. I don't mind busyness, silliness, messiness. Big shock, eh? So the kids had a lot of space to bounce around and have a lot of fun and be kind of crazy. But my, my thing was, like, when I tell you to do something, I want you to do it when I say do it. So we can have big wrestling time, we can have play time, but when I say, okay, it's time to get cleaned up and get ready for bed, I didn't want to debate, I didn't want to argue, I didn't want to play the stall game, the delay game. We're going to do what I say when I say it. If I say we're leaving at 10 a.m., be ready, we're leaving at 10 a.m. I'm setting the schedule, and we're all running on my time. And... Uh, 
we had this little Korean girl who lived with us for a year. And some of you remember Gio. That was the hardest thing for her to get her head around. That I would say, we're leaving at this time. And uh, many a day, she would come running out to the car with her shoes in her hands as I'm backing out of the driveway. Because when I said, we're leaving at this time, it didn't mean start getting ready at this time. It meant, see you later. So, that was a challenge for not all Koreans, James. Not all Koreans have that problem. He's got stories. Here's something you need to think about. Jesus says, watch and be ready. Behold, I come quickly. You don't know the day or the hour, so watch and be ready. When Jesus says it is time to go, you don't get to say, uh, just wait a second. Uh, oh, wait, I, a few more things i got to get accomplished. Can I just run over here real quick and... No. God is not operating on your time or your schedule. We're on His time. If you are a follower, a disciple, a bondservant, you are to do what He wants done when He wants it done. Not what you want to do whenever you feel like doing it. Interesting, He uses the comparison of plowing a field. Plowing a field. Anybody plowed a field before? I know some of you have. Yes, a few of you have done that. So... Uh, you're going to plow a field in the spring to get ready to sow seeds. And the comparison of ministry to farming is a very common illustration in Scripture because these are agricultural people. Agricultural communities are very much in tune with seasons. Once it is the season to do something, you've got to get out and do it as soon as possible because you have this window to plant because there's a limited amount of time that those crops need to grow. And once that, they have grown they got to be harvested. And there's a limited amount of time to get it harvested before they all die because of the cold and the snow, and they're done. And once they've grown and they're not harvested, uh, you, you've missed it. You miss any of these seasons, you're going to be out of luck for the entire year. And if you're out of luck for the entire year, it might mean you're going to go broke. You could lose the farm, which is an expression. It's actually from a literal thing. You could lose the farm. And third, you could starve to death. Worst case scenario. So when it's time to plow and plant, you got to get out there and get it done. If you're still planting during the growing season, you're behind schedule. You're going to miss the, if you miss the growing season, then you're not going to be in time for the harvest season. And if you miss the harvest season and nothing's ready and the snow comes, you got your plants half grown and they're half there, but nothing's ready to be harvested, you're done, you're broke, you go hungry. So when it's time to get going, you got to get going. Furthermore, think about this. When you're plowing a field, as he says, when you put your hand to the plow, the object is to choose a, well, the object is to make straight rows, right? Because straight rows gives you the utmost efficiency for your field. Straight rows make it easier to tend your plants, and it makes it easier to harvest your crops. So in order to have straight rows, you have to train your eye on something out here in front and stay focused, looking straight ahead. And that way, you'll drive straight and you'll have a straight row. If you're looking down at the rows to see if they're straight, you will overcompensate and your rows will go like this. Right? So you've got to keep a steady line. I think um, sailing a boat is kind of the same thing. You gotta, all the Navy people know that. You've kind of got to look up here. If you're, if you're looking to the left or the right, right, what happens? You go that way. And this is what they teach you in driver's ed, didn't they? Where you're looking is where you're driving. So I, see, I do the Stiliano. I'll go, oh, look at those Christmas lights. And she's like, oh, yeah, look at the road. <laughs> I'm like, it's the lights. So, yeah, you tend to do that, right? Jesus says, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back. Why? What happens when you're looking back? Right? You're turning back. All the stuff in the past, what are you looking at? What are you turning back to? There's a million reasons why back there that you'll delay to follow. A million reasons why you'll want to go back. What is your reasons? And why don't you want to follow? What stuff back there has got your attention? Looking back at family, back at old friends, 
back at things that you left behind. Old jobs, old traditions, old girlfriends, old boyfriends, parties you used to attend, a lifestyle of sin that you used to enjoy. You start looking back and what's going to happen? You're going to turn back. So what are the reasons that you turn back? What are the reasons why you won't fall? There's, there's a million. What is one good reason why you would follow Jesus? I'll give you one good reason. Jesus says, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looking back is worthy of the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God. This is what Jesus is calling us to. Not a life of ease and security. Not a life of pleasing family and friends. Not a chance to do things at your way, on your timetable. All of the reasons to not follow are plentiful. But if you do, he's offering you eternal life. An inheritance in eternal kingdom. Jesus says you will be a co heir Imagine that. Anybody got an inheritance waiting for them? I want to talk to you. I've got to sign you up for horrible. An eternal inheritance of a heavenly home, a son and daughter of God. That's what he's offering you. That's what we got. And that is one good reason for me to follow. What about you? Well chosen, songs as always, Brother Mike, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, back there, and I'm look, not looking back at it. The cross before me. No turning back. And then the last verse, though none go with me, so I will follow. No turning back. So there's a million reasons why you'd walk away from Jesus. 2021 is going to give you plenty of opportunities to quit. Which will you decide? Follow Jesus or to turn back? I guess time will tell, won't it? Lord Jesus, we just pray that we would have the strength and the courage to put all the other voices aside, all the other distractions aside, all the other traditions aside, that we would put away all of the things in our past and that we will just put our eyes straight on you and follow you. Commit our way to the Lord. Trust in Him and see what you're going to do, what you will bring to pass in our lives. Lord, we know, we know in this time, in this era, that we are moving into a, a dark time when people are going to fall away for all kinds of reasons. And it's going to be a challenge to follow you. We see this in other parts of the world. We're seeing it around the country. Even just to stay open means fines and, and attacks all kinds of uncomfortable situations, court cases and whatnot. Lord, we know that uh, these things can be right around the corner for each and every one of us, and we'll have to decide. So we pray that we will follow you, no turning back. Pray this, give us a faith in this wisdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.